All right. Hi, everyone. Um, so as Massey said, I'm going to talk about mostly the DHT and how we can open it to larger content providers. Um, maybe you know it's been um, a pain for large content provider to provide a lot of content to the DHT because the implementation hasn't been that efficient. And one motivation on why we want large content provider to um, advertise the data on the DHT is to get them away from BitSwap because some of the large content providers are only um, providing on BitSwap and BitSwap is very chatty. It's a lot of spam across the network. If the only way to get some content is to go through BitSwap and so that's to get them to the DHT so we can get all IPFS less chatty and more resource efficient. So <clears throat> how does the DHT uh, provide process work? Because that's what we want to, to improve. Um, so when a node wants to advertise that it has some content um, to the DHT, um, what we do is we need to find the 20 closest peers to this CID and then ask them to um, store a provider record, which is basically a pointer um, mapping the CID to the peer ID of the provider, such that anyone that is looking for this piece of content, this CID, can um, look up the 20 closest peers and at least one of them will be there online and will say, okay, this peer ID um, is providing this content. So now in terms of a performance, um, in order to find the 20 closest peers, usually in the IPFS network, we need around like three or four hops. Um, the way it works is we have um, concurrency parameters, so we can have at least, uh, so we can have at most 10 in-flight messages at once, which is I won't just ask, um, so w when I'm looking in my writing table for the closest peer to a CAD, um, I will not send just one message. I will send the message to uh, 10 of the closest peers I know and get back an answer and iteratively get closer and closer. So it means that the overall number of messages that I send to discover the 20 closest peers um, will be around 30 at the moment. Um, note that when I say 20, it's the uh, replication uh, factor, which sometimes is referred to as K, but uh, K has multiple meaning in Kademnia, so I'm going to refer to this parameter as um, rep uh, for the rest of the presentation. And then once we've found uh, these 20 closest peers, we want to allocate the provider record to these peers, so that's um, additional messages. So now looking at it in, in terms of number of connections to open and number of messages to send, um, we get that we need to open approximately 35 connections, so new connection when we allocate one provider record. I mean, when we advertise one CID, which means uh, allocating 20 uh, provider records. So most likely for the first hop of the DHT resolution, we will already be connected to the peers. So that's good. We don't need to open a new connection. And then when iteratively getting closer, we need to open some new connection. So approximately 15. So, so that's just back of the envelope calculation. And then uh, to find the 20 closest peers, uh, we need to send 20 message. Uh, yeah, we need to open the connection to these 20 peers. Um, on the number of messages, so it's approximately 70. So 50 for the lookup and we need to send the provider records. So 20 times, which is 20 messages. Now, how does it look for large content provider? So let's say um, a large content provider wants to provide 1 billion CID um, to the DHT. Now, every single uh, CID must be reprovided uh, periodically. So after 20, uh, sorry, after 48 hours, um, all the provider records will be garbage collected. So we get rid of them and just uh, providers need to republish. And the reprovide interval has been set to 22 hours based on measurements because what we want, uh, the, the first priority is that the content is still available. So even though the, the provider record will be garbage collected after 48 hours, if all of the peers that are storing my provider record 
go away because of the churn, because you open your laptop, you get some content allocated, and then you close the laptop. Um, we need to make sure that the content is provided every 22 hours. And so it means that in terms of um, number of open connection, so um, now if we want to provide 1 billion CID, if it's a 35 connection we need to open for each CID, that's 35 billion uh, connection we need to open in 22 hours. So that's like uh, 450 connection per second. So that's a lot. And number of message sent, it's um, approximately the double this number. So that's why um, the DHT is currently very friendly uh, for large content providers. And this is a major problem. So there are ways around this, such as using the accelerated DHT client. And I'll come, I'll come at this uh, solution at the end of the, of the presentation. So what, point, what can we do to optimize now this um, reprovide operation? Because we need to reprovide every 22 hours. So now you're going to tell me, OK, we need to reprovide like 1 billion CID, but we only have 20,000 peers in the, um, in the DHT which means that I could just open a connection to these 20,000 peers and send them all of the CIDs instead of looking for the same peers over and over again, closing the connection, opening again. And so that's, so we can just use the pigeonhole principle because we have much more CIDs than DHT servers. And it means that we're going to allocate multiple CIDs on the very same DHT servers. So what we can do is just group the CIDs we want to provide by XOR distance, which means that um, yeah, all of the CIDs that are close together will be allocated on the very same uh, DHT server. And just sequentially, so we open the connection to this DHT server and send it all of the, um, all of the provider records that we allocate to them at once. And so in order to optimize this, we can just sweep the key space, so from the key 0000 to the key 11111. And when we get to a peer, we just say, OK, here are all the, the CIDs I want you to advertise for me. And then go to the next peer um, and continue to just sweep this way. And this way, we can minimize the number of connections to open and of messages to send. And so we, we should get approximately um, the number of connection to open should be approximately the number of um, DHT server peers. So now let's get to the details of um, how it works. So I have on the right hand side a binary try, which is a prefix tree, which is commonly used to represent distance in the DHT. So in the rightmost column, we have the peer IDs. So those are the, the peers, the nodes. And all of the other, um, let's say, cells in, in this graph are just, um, let's say, intermediary cells to represent distance. So just to draw the, the binary try. And so here in this example, we have keys, so peer IDs, that, have, um, that are represented by a big string, bit string of length 8. And in Kademlia, we have bit string of length 256, just because it wouldn't be readable to um, have such a deep uh, tree. So yeah, so this, uh, this, yeah, this uh, representation is optimized when we are looking for a key. So in a database, when we are doing um, XOR distance arithmetic, this uh, binary try is the optimized data structure to uh, do lookup and add and so on. And uh, that's the visual representation that will help us understand what's happening. And so that's a, um, also what we're using to group the CIDs that are close together. So now we define, so in this binary try, a key space region. So we define a key space region as um, a region where um, um, all, where so, let's say the interme intermediary nodes are prefixes of the keys, and if a prefix has at least um, 
uh, so the replication number children, which uh, we'll go through an example then, um, it is considered as, um, as a region. And we are interested in uh, finding the smallest number of possible regions that are fully covering the key space. So now if we go through an example, we get that the um, replication factor will be three for this example. And so if we take the first, uh, so the topmost um, yellow rectangle, we have that uh, in the rightmost column, we have four peers. And so they all start with the prefix zero, zero. And so we can see that the prefix zero, zero has four children or four nodes within it. And so it's defined as a, a proper region. Now going to the second region, we can see that the prefix uh, 0, 1, 1 has exactly three nodes within it. So it could be a region. However, the prefix 0, 1, 0, which is just above, has only two nodes in it, which is not enough to make a region. And so we need to combine them together to make sure that, so here the prefix 0, 1 has more than three um, nodes within it. And so you can apply the same logic. So um, going below, so it means that the, the region will always approximately have the same size, which is going to be slightly more than the replication factor, but um, it's not necessarily prefixes with the same length. So we can see then there's uh, the prefix 1000. Zero, zero, zero. Um, so it's a prefix of length four, whereas before we had prefixes of length two. And so this region would, will, will be useful in order to understand where we need to store um, our CIDs. So a CID will only be stored, so all of the replica of the CIDs will always be stored in the very same region. Now, how do we explore um, a region and make sure that it is a region? So we need, what we need to do is to look up a random key within the target region. And if some of the um, return peers do not match the region's prefix, it means that the region has been fully explored. And otherwise, um, if all of the peers um, are within the region, we must explore the neighboring region, which means that we take the prefix, flip the last bit, and generate so a new key there and explore the new subregion um, until the region is fully explored. We have enough peers um, in this subregion. And now, once we have this region, what we want to do is sweep all of the region um, from the key space, let's say from left to right or top to bottom, doesn't really matter, but from the 0, 0, 0 to the 1, 1, 1. <coughs> and once we are in a region, we need to reprovide all of the CIDs that are matching this region. Um, and so it means that once the sweep is over, I have reprovided all of my CIDs. So it means that the, um, the sweep needs to take approximately reprovide interval, so 24 hours to complete, or can take up to 24 hours to complete. Um, in order to, to do this, we need to store the peers in a binary try, so that it's easier to keep track of the regions. And the um, seeds will be stored in the binary try as well, in order to understand in which region they belong. And so it's also optimized for um, faster insert or delete of the, suite, of the um, CIDs. <coughs> now, um, how does reprovising work within a region? So within a region, we need to define a temporary key value store that will map peer IDs um, to keys. So we basically want to list all of the keys that must be allocated for every uh, peer ID in this region. So we just iterate on the seeds that belong to this region and map them to, so here, as we want to replicate them 20 times, we map each key to 20 peer IDs. And then once we have this map, we just iterate over the peer IDs of the region, we open the new connection, and then we allocate whatever number of CIDs we have to allocate them. So it means that we open the connection once and then send multiple messages, once, uh, one for each a CID we want to reprovide. And 
um, so the the number of workers can uh, easily be limited uh, so in the implementation. Um, now, how do we schedule this? So ideally, we do not really want to reprovide everything at once, which is what the accelerated DHT client is doing, just because it's causing like a rush hour and like you do everything at once, then you can shut up your node. And in, I mean, in some application, this would be needed, but um, usually it's more resource efficient to spread um, the use of resource over time. Um, so each region, so if you take the very same region with the very same prefix, should be republished um, within the reprovide interval. Otherwise, maybe the data will, the, the provide the record wouldn't be available anymore. <clears throat> and so as the regions may grow or shrink, um, the delays within the region may need to be adjusted. And we need to have a scheduler to keep track on where, when to reprovide uh, each region. And also it's important, like one important role of the scheduler is what if, uh, so I was providing um, in a sweep and over and over again, and then my nodes goes offline. And then when it goes online again, uh, I need to catch up for the things that I didn't reprovide. And so I will try to reprovide as fast as possible until I get back on track. So now, concretely, um, how does it work with... So yeah, let's take how it works from the start. So now I have no CIDs that I track and um, the IPFS implementation is asking me, uh, so DHT implementation, uh, to provide a first CID. Um, so the, the first provide of the CID isn't timely. Uh, no, no, sorry, it, it is timely because when I want to um, publish some file, so I advertise it on the DHT and then maybe I email, immediately want to send it to a friend and I want this friend to be able to get it from the DHT. So I need to provide the CID immediately. But then the reprovide isn't timely because I have 22 hours to reprovide, so it doesn't matter if I reprovide it after 15 hours or 20 hours or 22 hours. So that doesn't matter if it takes more, even if it takes seconds or minutes to reprovide. And so it means that what I'm going to do is when I receive a provide, I will just do the lookup and allocate to the 20 closest peers. But then I will not wait necessarily 22 hours to reprovide. Um, because the CID will belong to a region that will be scheduled to be reprovided at a given time. And so I will just put these new CIDs uh, with the region and republish it at the time that was planned for this region. So now what happens when a region is shrinking? Which means that if a region has, so in our example, we got like a replication factor of three. So we needed each region to have at least three peers. Now if peers go offline and a region only has two peers left, what happens? So in this case, if we have a region with less than the replication factor um, of peers, it must be merged with its neighboring region. So the region, so if you take the prefix identifying the region, you flip the last bit, you get the neighbor, and you just migrate the, the regions together to a larger region. So it means that um, the time the content will be um, uh, reprovided will be slightly changed because both of the neighboring region each, each had their time at which the content would have been reprovided. So where we can do it, ju just take them the soonest um, time to reprovide all of the content. And same for region expansion. So if a region grows and at the point it can be slip, a split into two distinct regions, so two regions that have at least um, a rep peer inside, um, then we can just reprovide both regions for the first time at uh, the time that was planned for the region to be reprovided. And then the scheduler will make sure to just space the reprovide time um, so that not everything happens at once. So now I'm just going to give an intuition of why um, this is correct, or the, the, the reprovide scheme works. 
is um, when we have the first provide, um, um, we just need to find a region where this CID belongs. We add the region to the scheduler and it will be scheduled to be reprovided every 22 hours. So that's for the very first CID. And then when new CIDs are added, they are added either to a new region where there was no CID, so a new region is defined and added to the scheduler, or they are added to an existing region. And then it's just um, basically um, induction. So if the region grows, so I mean, you're going to add the CIDs to the already existing region, and now the region are going to shrink or expand depending on the peer churn in the network. And so that's how we define that the, the, the reprovide happen. So now um, let's come to the performance evaluation and try to yeah, measure the, the, the performance. So if, again, taking a um, large content provider, we're providing 1 billion CIDs um, every 22 hours using IPFS realistic settings. So um, we measured approximately 20,000 uh, DHT server nodes, and we have a replication factor of 20. So it makes us, so to know the number of region, it's approximately the number of peers over um, twice the replication factor. Because yeah, on average, I mean, an upper bound of the um, um, region size is twice the replication factor. So we get approximately 500 regions. Um, in order to explore a region, we need approximately 55 uh, we need to open approximately 55 connections and to send 70 messages. So the number of connections to be open in order to reprovide the 1 billion CID is expected to be around 28,000, whereas it was uh, 35 billion uh, for the Vanilla provide operation. So we got an improvement of the order of 1 million, which is huge in the number of connections. And then in the number of messages to be sent, so we'll need to send um, approximately, so 500 times 70, which is the number of regions, times the number of messages to explore a region, plus as we need to provide 1 billion CID and each one of them to 20 peers, we need to send 20 million um, messages to provide CIDs. And so that's kind of the limit, so we can approximate the number of messages to be sent to just the number of replica of provider records. And so when we compare it with the Vanilla provide operation, we got an improvement of 3.5x, uh, which is also good, but not as um, impressive as the number of connection um, to be open. So now um, we can compare, compare it with the provide many uh, from the acceler accelerated DHT client or full RT, which is the same thing. So what the accelerated DHT client does well is that um, it will group the CIDs by XOR distance when reproviding, which means that, okay, it's reproviding everything at once, which is um, good and bad. It's good because you can group the CIDs and minimize the number of connections to be open. But it's bad because it will cause a rush hour, so you just uh, reprovide everything at once and yeah, generate a lot of network traffic. Also, another problem of the accelerated DHT client is that it may contain stale entries in the routing table because it is made... Um, um, so you do not make a lookup before um, allocating the, um, the CID to the 20 closest peers, what you do is you run a crawler, I think, every hour. And so the crawler is going to give you an image of the network, but maybe you're going to reprovide one, uh, like 50 minutes after, and the network has totally changed, and you don't have a clue about this, so you're going to allocate to the wrong peers, or peers that aren't online anymore. Um, and running this crawler in order to refresh the routing table is also expensive because you need to basically connect to every single peers, every um, refresh interval, which I think is one hour. And also it's not very optimized because the, the seeds are grouped um, 
uh, the seeds group are have a constant size, um, which means that it isn't optimized um, because of the try. Because uh, yeah, if you if you order them in a linear way and group them with a constant size, um, you will not respect the try and the prefixes of them, and so you will end up um, yeah, allocating them on the on the wrong peers and opening more uh, uh, more connections. So in order to get there and be able to implement this, um, we need to tackle a few other problems first. Um, yeah, as always. So now the way the DHT work is when you want to provide something, there is just a provide interface to the DHT or to content routers in general, which I think isn't good because it, it means that in the current situation, the IPFS implementation, so Kubo or any other implementation, need to handle the reprovide themselves, which means that if Kubo wants to track some content, it must have the timer and no have knowledge about the DHT or any other content routing uh, system, such as IPNI, know which one it is using and know how to reprovide using this content routing system. And what we should do instead is having each content routing system have its own reprovide mechanism because they all work differently. IPNI um, is totally different than uh, the DHT for reprovading. But we should just have a simple interface such as Okay, start providing content, stop providing content, such that uh, the, the, the IPFS implementation doesn't need to have any knowledge about how reprovading works in a specific um, content routing system and can just say, okay, please start providing for me and I don't need it anymore, you can stop providing it. And so it means that we need to change the um, interfaces um, in how it works, but yeah, I think um, this will be done in the in the coming month. So now, so yeah, that was the explanation of um, how we can minimize the the reprovide cost for anyone. I mean, it works especially good for the large content providers, but if you are advertising um, some content on your local Kubo node, it's also an optimization for you. And it enables large content provider to use the DHT and slowly get away from the bit swap broadcast, which is good. And um, we want to ship this along with the double hash DHT uh, later this year, um, so that um, yeah, it's uh, if you switch to the to the double hash DHT, uh, you have some extra benefits um, uh, that is uh, you can reprovide in a much uh, more efficient way. And there's the, um, uh, if you're curious about it, there's the Notion page that you can check out on which the updates will be happening. So yeah, that was it for me. <laughs> yeah, Thomas. Isn't the current solution where you have to reprovide sort of like a stopgap mechanism where you make sure that you spend some cost or you have some cost with wanting to provide content to the network. Um, yeah, but this solution will not change this. You will still need to reprovide every 22 hours. It's just you reprovide in a more efficient way. So is the, the, the main performance bottleneck we're addressing here is the connection establishment? Is that? Yeah, I think so. I mean, I haven't uh, tried to uh, advertise that much content myself, but okay. just looking at the back of the envelope calculation, opening uh, 450,000 connections per second seems a lot to me. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you're going to have to send the messages either way at, at that rate, right? Yeah, I mean, yeah, you need to send a lot of messages anyway, but if you minimize the number of lookups you do, you reduce the number of messages you send by 3.5x already. Okay, so it's okay. So it's not necessarily the number. Of, it's not just the connection establishment, then it's the numbers, the lookups that are expensive, right? Um, yeah, because I'm just curious because I know that, like, for example, like we've been talking a lot about Quick, and that actually has like a zero round trip time connection establishment. Um, 
Yeah. So, but if it's actually the cost of doing the lookup, that makes more sense because you're going to be uh, sending a lot more messages to do the lookup. Yeah, right? exactly. So okay. if, if we look just in the number of messages, we we'll still get a 3.5x improvement. Right, right. And okay. just because you do much less uh, lookups. And basically the only messages you get to send is the, the provider record. Interesting talk. Thank you, Guy. So I had a question. Uh, in the last slide, you mentioned this is going to be rolled out with the double hashing. Why, why the two are coupled? I, I see three distinct things that you pointed out. One is the interface changes. The other one is the core work here, which is just making provide more efficient. Uh, so I'm curious why they're bundled up with the double hashing as well. I'd say mostly for practical reason because both need some refactor and so once we can refactor uh, and include both features at once and it's just easier. What's next? So when can I see this in Kubo for example? Like what's the plans for things like load testing? Because I'm, I'm curious to see what it actually, how it actually behaves in the, in the wild. Um, so yeah, next is the implementation which will happen once the double hash, uh, double hash implementation is done. And then, yeah, probably it will be integrated into Kubo at the same time of the, as the double hash. Uh, in terms of testing, this can be done on the provider side only, right? Yeah, uh, it's just so, a So we can change. test it ourselves before the release. Yeah, it's just uh, a client change. Yeah. Okay. So, so it's great. a client optimization. We don't need to push it everywhere. Yeah. Um, it's just if we ship it in a new Kubo version, people running this Kubo version can start benefiting from it. Yeah, but in the testing phase, we can test it ourselves without having everyone to upgrade, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly. Okay, that's great, yeah. Thank you.